Hi guys, Alec Pierce from Vintage Cuba, and this is a little different topic today. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's theoretical, in fact, just the opposite. It might be very, very practical. We're going to talk about, as you can see from the uh, thumbnail, we're going to talk about recompression chambers. Yeah, recompression chambers in the, in the old days, vintage. Uh, we didn't have any because old divers didn't get decompression sickness. We were too good. Actually, <laughs> Diving was a lot different back then. We didn't dive as deep generally, like recreational divers, commercial divers did the same as they always done. But we didn't dive as deep in those days, but certainly accidents did happen. And recompression chambers are not used just to uh, treat decompression sickness, they're also treated, used for other diver maladies such as uh, embolism, uh, serious uh, uh, ear injuries even. Uh, let's clear up one more little bit of terminology just so we can finish this 10 minute chat quickly and easily. There are two words, decompression and recompression. What's the difference? Well, decompression is usually used to describe a sickness that occurs when air bubbles that are dissolved in your air, air that's dissolved in your bloodstream, decompresses, uncompresses and forms a bubble. You see? So you get decompression sickness, bubbles form. How do you cure, cure decompression sickness? Well, you have to get rid of the bubbles. You have to recompress them. And that's, what you, that's why you go to a recompression chamber. A recompression chamber is used to treat decompression. Got you completely confused now? <laughs> Just think about it, that a recompression chamber is used to recompress the bubbles that are causing your problem, be it embolism or decompression sickness. Okay, that'll help. So we're going to talk about recompression chambers. Now, interestingly enough, in the old days, we did have problems, maladies, and, and recompression chambers were not terribly uncommon. We didn't have the great, big, fantastic commercial diving chambers that you see today. They're, they're monsters. They're usually in hospitals, diving facilities, uh, military, a lot in the military because you have a lot of divers, of course, and uh, they're big. You know, they could, they could they fill a room, a good-sized room. They could be 12 to 15 feet long, 6, 7 feet in diameter. And, you know, they sometimes operate in there. So there might be the patient and a doctor and a couple of nurses. There might be three or four or five people in a modern recompression chamber. They may be small. They may be just, just big enough to, to adequately treat one person, or they could be very, very big. They also cost a lot of money. And we're not talking a couple of thousand dollars here. We're talking more likely a couple of million dollars. And, of course, there's a, the trained personnel because somebody has to be trained on how to operate the recompression chamber properly and, and probably medically trained as well. You have to have doctors, people on staff. So it's a big deal today. A modern recompression chamber facility is a, is a big, big deal. Well, we didn't have that in the old days, but we did have recompression chambers. What did they look like? Well, they were a lot smaller. Uh, we wanted to have, you know, it was good to have Some dive stores had them. And occasionally a diver had them. That's right. In, in those days, you could buy your own. Yeah. If you, if you, maybe if you weren't a very good diver, huh? Do you have one, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, that's not true, of course. Uh, but there was, it was possible, at least, for a person to go and buy a recompression chamber. I, I don't, I can't, I guess it's possible today if you have enough money, but I don't know why you would. There are enough around now, training, you wouldn't need to. But in the old days, you could actually get your own, and you would get an instruction manual with it. <laughs> I would explain how to use it and so on, so that if you had a problem or your neighbors or diabetes had a problem, you could do it. Well, anyway, uh, and, and they were smaller. They were usually a lot smaller. I think mean, the big ones they have today, one or two people, two people maybe would be a big one, but that would be about it. So where did you get them? Well, I can show you. You uh, occasionally, I think, can you still get scuba catalogs, Kevin? Or do you everybody goes online? I think you still get catalogs. Scuba Pro still has a catalog. And interesting enough, Scuba Pro is one of the companies that sold recompression chambers. So you can actually go to a scuba catalog. They were sold in the catalog in the, uh, in the, from about the 50s to the 70s and that time race, certainly in the 50s and 60s. You could go to a lot of catalogs. Scuba Pro was one. I think we have a picture of a Scuba Pro catalog, don't we? In Aqualung. Aqualung as well. Here's some pictures here of some catalogs with the recompression chamber for sale. So you could go to your local dive store and say, hey, I saw this uh, collapsible portable chamber for, for $900 in your catalog. Uh, how long would it get? For, can you get one of those in? You don't have them in stock, right? And <laughs> you talk just like buying a mask. And you would buy a recompression chamber. And the dive store would call you. And, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Pierce, yeah, your recompression chamber has arrived. Uh, you want to come and pick it up? Now, it's pretty big. You'll need at least a pickup truck. 
and you drive over and give the dog store your money and drive home with a recompression chamber. I guess you put it in the garage. I don't know. You need an air compressor and lots of other stuff too. But that's just about the way it was. You could just buy them. And there were different models, and they ranged in price. Some were pretty cheap, $1,000, two or $3,000 perhaps to get you a nice big one. Uh, Aqualong had Skiver Pro. I mentioned Skiver Pro. I think there's an ad from Skiver Pro here, isn't there, here, Kevin? It shows the Skiver Pro one, and other companies as well that you don't know as well. Uh, Spiro Technique had one. It was, uh, it was a, a small one as well. Healthways actually had a pretty neat one. There's a good picture of the Healthways one here. And the Healthways one was kind of neat because it was on wheels. Yeah, so if you're going to the dive site, you know how when you go to the dive site now, sometimes you take a trailer to carry your gear and your buddy's gear and maybe a compressor and stuff like that. Well, you could uh, take your recompression chamber, <laughs> trailer behind your car. The diver says, hey, oh, what do you got? You got all your dive gear? Oh, no, that's my recompression chamber. Are you planning on having an accident? Anyway, that's quite true. Healthways, there's a picture of one here. In uh, 1969, Healthways had a recompression chamber in their, in their catalog, and uh, it was on wheels. Simple. And there were some other models. One of one of uh, uh, Skiver Pro's, one of uh, Aqualung's models. I remember an Aqualung model was collapsible. So you know a recompression chamber by its very nature has to be, well, it has to be six feet long. Assuming the patient's six feet long, six feet long. It's pretty big, pretty big. But the 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 uh, uh, Aqualung model was collapsible, and it, it was several sections, and the sections collapsed on each other. Like a telescope, you know, like a telescope, and you will collapse and make it only about three and a half feet long. And two guys should pick it up, put it in the back of their pickup truck, and go home. I don't know if they treated divers at a dive site and charged them. It's, it's big bucks. But anyway, that's what you can do. You got to order them from catalogs. Aqualong, Spiro Technique, which is French, Nemrod. Nemrod is a name that you may recall from some of this stuff we've talked about in Spain. Um, in England, a company called Sieb Gordon, Gorman, Sieb Gorman. And they made a lot of scuba gear, two hose regulators. Some of you collectors may know them as well. And they had them as well. That was very simple. Now, what did you do with it? So you go and you spend your thousand dollars at your local dive store, and and uh, and you go and pick up your recompression chamber, and uh, and you bring it home. You read the owner's manual, and it says uh, plug it in, and then connect to the internet. No. <laughs> No internet. <laughs> Plug it in, and then you hook it up to your compressor because you have to have compressed air. So you have your compressor and everything else. And then it says, "Okay, uh, uh, put your patient inside, lock the door." And then it had to explain in detail what to do. And this is where you you turned away from a technical operation into a medical operation, because here is where the ability to assess a patient's problem, how serious it was, became important. And this is also very important uh, for divers to remember, uh, and not that you need to be reminded not to get decompression sickness. Everybody knows how serious it is. But to remember that recompression treatment is not fun. But basically, the way the treatment works, and this is just a paraphrasing what it sa says in the U.S. Navy, Navy Diving Manual, is that if you were exhibiting signs of decompression sickness, and again, there's where a doctor or a medically trained person had to assess you, is it decompression sickness, or is it, is it a sea wasp sting or something else? But if you were exhibiting signs of decompression sickness, then they would put you into the chamber. And they would begin to increase the pressure. And, uh, and as they're doing that, they're talking to you. They have a, they have a, 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 a microphone, an intercom, and they would be talking to you and say, how do you feel, how do you feel? And the pressure would start increasing. And how's your, how's your uh, knee and your hip now? Well, you know, it's no better if you know, you keep the, and they would keep increasing the pressure. It would take you down and down and down until they got to about 60 feet, roughly. Roughly 60 feet, the pressure at 60 feet. It's sort of the defining depth or defining pressure. And when you got to about 60 feet, they would say, okay, uh, how are you feeling? And uh, there's only two answers, I feel like crap, or, uh, oh, I'm feeling a lot better now. And uh, if, if, if you say, well, I'm feeling better, there's no pain, I can move on my finger, there's no pain at all, then that would determine, to some extent, that would determine how much treatment you needed. Well, if your symptoms did disappear before 60 feet, after maybe 5 or 10 minutes, then the treatment would be short. And it's not fun, because it's, it's, it's hot, and it's very humid in there, and as, you start to, as the pressure starts to drop, you start to get cold, and you're confined, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you are claustrophobic, don't get decompression sickness. They're not very big chambers, the smaller ones. And slowly they would bring you back up to the surface. And finally, when finally you were back up to atmospheric level, and they opened the door and you came out, hopefully, finally, that was it. Reoccurrences of decompression sickness after treatment 
are not uncommon. So that's basically what would happen. And then if you got down to 60 feet and you said, no, no, I can hardly move my shoulder so awfully painfully, but it keep increasing the pressure. And it could take you down quite deep. I believe uh, from, from what I recall in the U.S. Navy tables, 165 feet is about the maximum depth that they would take a, 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 a patient suffering from decompression sickness too. Now, I don't know if 165 feet is a technical depth or medical depth. I do know that 165 feet, the bubbles, any bubbles that are in your body are compressed very, very small. Probably gone back in the solution. At 165 feet, the pressure is so great that going deeper probably isn't going to help anymore. Maybe that's the way they decided 165. But whatever, they could take you that deep and you could be a very, very long time in that chamber. Not much fun. And inexpensive as well. Uh, typical, typically, Health insurance plans, your health insurance plan, not interested. That's a special treatment as a result of a, an injury caused by uh, dangerous or hazardous activities. No insurance. That's why DAN insurance is so valuable. Anyway, let's not get into that. Let's stay on the topic here of recompression chambers. And it's pretty neat. I have seen some of these recompression chambers, these portable ones. I've seen a couple of them. You go into a catalog for sure, an occasional dive store, and there would be a recompression chamber for sale. Brand new in the box. Yeah, pretty neat. Anyway. Scuba diving in the old days, in Stone Age, as Kevin says. Vintage scuba. I hope there's something in there of interest to you. Talk to you real soon again, Alec Pierce.